It's the My First Gig Podcast, whoa, sharing stories of first gigs and shows, comedians sharing their memories, the fun and entertaining, exciting and crazy, with Dwayne Dugan as your host, it's the My First Gig Podcast, here we Hello and welcome to another edition of the My First Gig Podcast with me, your host, Dwayne Dugan. I'll I'll admit, guys, I I'm I've no idea what's going on. This episode is released at 6 a.m. It is now 5.34. So when you say I've left it to the last minute, I really have. Like the thing is, is that these podcasts take a while to edit. And every week now I've said, hey, get it done before Tuesday so you have it ready for Wednesday. And no, here I am. It's now technically Wednesday. I'm in tomorrow, but it's you're, you're in today. I've time traveled to tomorrow to Wednesday to record this, to deliver this podcast. So I'm a little all over the place. I, I, I'm, I've never had a regular sleeping pattern. I, I remember once when I was sometime in my early 20s, I slept for like a week and a half going to bed at say half 11 at night or something like that waking up fresh at like seven in the morning and I couldn't believe it the stuff I got done how good I felt I found out that I had free time I was awake for the same amount of time in the day but working those hours or being alive those hours I I ended up with more free time doing things I remember calling up my dad and being like hey I've discovered this new thing right I'm not sure if you've heard of it it's something I've been working on for a while now and it's changed my life and I just want to share the secret with you before it gets out. And he's like, what is it? I sleep at night time and I'm awake during the day. And I, I, I genuinely had this thought that like I'd invented something. I was the Christopher Columbus of sleeping, you know, the best time to do it. I discovered it. I'd conquered it. And now I was, you know, going to be the most successful man in the world. And it lasted 10 days. And that's probably about 10 years ago now and I haven't slept at night time since. So here we are, almost 6 o'clock. I'm looking forward to heading to bed. Hopefully you're looking forward to the episode today. It is with the wonderful Laura Lex. This is one of the more recent ones that I recorded, probably late last year. Laura was in Dublin doing a weekend of shows at the Laughter Lounge and I met up with her the day after the first show of the weekend. And this was a really fun chat. As Laura will tell you, and you know, as you'll hear with the details that she gets into, she is a comedy nerd. So it was real fun to kind of get really deep into some of these topics of the first gig and how you approach it. So really, really hope you like it. If you subscribe to the podcast for some of the other episodes and you've stumbled across on this one now and you're thinking, I'm not sure who Laura Lex is, not familiar with her stuff, head on over to YouTube, check her out live at the Apollo, check her out on Roast Battle. Head on over to Next Up Comedy. Fans of Next Up Comedy, a lot of the people we're talking to you'll find on Next Up Comedy. Her show, Tyrannosaurus Lex and Trine are both on there. Uh, I think those two. If not, send them an email, ask them why not. Fantastic comedian, fantastic chat. It's a really fun episode. And on the topic of her being a comedy nerd, we recorded some bonus questions on what it takes to deliver as a compare, on which Laura's won many awards and as I find myself as, you know, a regular compare at clubs that I play, it was fun to pick her brain and get the perspective of somebody else. And hopefully that'd be interesting to you. I've got a lot of those kind of bonus questions. There's a real interesting one, again, kind of for the comedy nerds from James A. Caster. There was some stuff from Ard Lohan and, and there's some from a lot of the guests in this series. I might package them up once the series ends and figure out what to do. If you If you have an interesting idea on how to get them out there then do let me know. I will add, there's not microphone issues. Sound is fine. You can just hear the microphone being fiddled with a lot. And it was after I listened to this one, I was like, oh God, right, these microphones, they weren't the best microphones, uh, uh, to be honest. And they were on their last legs completely. So I did go out, I replaced them, new equipment. And hopefully now, look, how's this sounding? Huh? Is that silence, is it? Am I sounding clear? I went out and got new equipment. Now, a lot of the interviews have been recorded on the old equipment, but they are a great chat, so don't worry about it. If I know you like I think you do, you can get over the issues. And now, when I say issues, they are very slight, you know, it's just in case anybody hears them and they're thinking, oh, that's annoying. They have been rectified and that will be better in future future episodes and future interviews. Or it is the best way to hype up an episode. Probably isn't going, here lads, I can't sleep and the microphones are bollocks. 
So, look, maybe I'll go away, you stay where you are, sit down, relax, get comfy, enjoy my first gig with Laura Lex. Oh, I was such a Boyzone fan as a kid. They were my, like, teenage... They were the top ones. Yeah, yeah. I was the perfect age for Boyzone, and then by the time Westlife came around, I wasn't that interested. But Boyzone was... I used to practice sketching the um, the symbol that they had, you know, the like circle with the black and white yeah. man thing. I used to practice that until I got it right. I once wrote to myself pretending to be Ronan Keating. That's what I was going to ask. When I heard you mention that, I was like, yeah. that can't be a real thing. No, that's no, yeah. a real thing. <laughs> and I got up early and left it in the porch so that my parents would think he was writing to me, which they did not. Was he very kind? Um, <laughs> he was very nice. He was really friendly. <laughs> For that one letter. I loved them. I, I loved everything they did. And I remember like going out of my way to find like a, I think it came free with like Smash Hits magazine or something, but an extra CD that had Experienza Religiosa, which was a song that they did that wasn't on any of their albums okay. and being really happy to get proper, it. Proper diehard then. Oh my God. Yeah. I loved them. Yeah. I remember those Smash Hits. You used to get them like, but the magazine would be in a box. Yeah. And then sometimes they'd give you like sweets and stuff. It was the weirdest time. Yeah, magazines used to be Crazy. huge, like, didn't they? Look In magazine was my favourite. And it had loads of stickers with it quite often. Now that you're here in Dublin and you're saying that you wanted to walk around the city, I'm, yeah. I'm sure you have a ton of boys unrelated landmarks <laughs> that you need to go check out. We see, this is my problem, I think. I'm never upset. Like, I loved Boys Own as a teenager. Sure. Loved them. I don't want to go and look at an old warehouse now yeah and pretend that the feelings are still there like when i see people now they're like oh my god spice girls are reforming and they're going on reunion you go but as an adult you can't possibly still listen to that music and think it's good you might have nostalgia with it i like i loved it when boys and comes up so my instagram i've been doing going back and listening to old now that's what i call music cds and picking the ones from my teenagers so when these brilliant ones come up i'm like oh yeah but i don't then dig out four albums and listen to them in a row like that's insanity i think you have to move on yeah i think cherry picking the the now cds are a good good way to go properly what number are you on now? Um, I'm dotting about a bit. The last one I did was now 30. That one was really good because that one was a little bit older. So there was like some stuff that was like, oh yeah, I remember my mum liking this one. Um, like Human League and Simple Minds and stuff, which was not stuff I was into. But you think, God, that was out at the same time as Love Me For A Reason. Yeah, I wouldn't have put that at the same time. I think the last one I remember having was now 38. Because they were a big deal. Yeah, huge, yeah. And I was always fascinated. It's like, oh, I hope the next one's blue. And for some like, just <laughs> the, the actual sleeve itself. <laughs> yeah. But no, that's right. I remember them right up to like the 50s and 60s, I think. And I always remember my grandma come, turning up and handing us a cassette. And like, oh, you left this at our house and it was now three. And us being like, uh, grandma, we were not alive for now three. <laughs> and as a kid, you'd be like, how could you not know that? grandma and now i look at the latest now singles and go i don't know do they still exist yeah yeah they still go i but they're all like justin bieber featuring this and then the next one is this featuring justin bieber it's like four artists make the whole cd they're gonna run out of numbers soon (laughs) so yeah so you're here here in dublin doing a weekend of shows at the time of recording but i want to ask earlier this year you were given the comedian's choice award yeah. At the Gilda Balloon for the second year. Yeah. Second year. So have we come up to water from all that yet? Yeah. It blew my mind this year, actually. Um, well, I mean, it was amazing last year. It was, yeah, I've I've never won an award that wasn't um, voted for by comics. And that feels really nice. Because you know what it's like with this industry, even when it's going really well, half your brain's going, you're a piece of shit and you should quit. And you're never going to be anything. But knowing that comedians like what you do, that makes it better. I think that kind of, I can sort of look at that award and go like, yeah, it's all right. Like the people that do the same as you value what you do, which is really nice. So I think it's like, I think it's Stuart Goldsmith. Um, His theory is that if comics like what you're doing, comedians are the only people without a vested interest in promoting you. 
Because like if you've got a PR person or an agent or TV stuff, they want to see what they can get from you. Whereas a comedian, it's in their best interest to tell everyone you're terrible. Well, like, that's it. It's like it's, it's, it's a, you know, as, as fun as it is, it's a bitchy backstabbing. Yeah, it's lovely. And I think like... I don't know, you know what it's like, you write a bit and you do it and the, half the audience get it, half go, oh yeah, it was quite funny because you said poo in it. And then comedians will see every piece of structure and choice that you've made. Like you sound like you're throwing away a line and actually they'll go, I like that you used that sound there because it's got the puh sound and that makes that word funnier. And you go, yeah. Like with my last couple of Edinburgh shows, I could constantly be getting in reviews. Oh, it's a good job she's cheerful because the material's like heavy and like complicated. And I'd be like, no, not a good job. I'm cheerful. I've done that on purpose. Whereas comics would come and see it and go, oh, that's really good. You've got the balance. They know that everything in a set or a show or whatever is your careful planning. It's not just how it was because it was you. Does that make sense? Like, well, no, that's it. You know, like yeah. like another comedian, they're good, they're you know they're clearly going to view it differently. But from a perspective that while you write it for an audience, you know what you've done to get there. Yeah. So I guess this is the tip yeah. of the hat going. We can see the effort and the. Yeah, it meant the world. I cried my eyes out <laughs> this year because, like last year, it was amazing. But my whole year last year was such a whirlwind because it was the day the day I won it in 2018 and I was popping around to my agents to get something and I was like he opened his front door and I was like oh babe like I uh, and he went oh you already know do you and I was like yeah Julian just rang me who was my PR guy and he was like oh I can't believe it and I and then I was talking about the award he thought I knew that I'd just been picked for live at the Apollo so we were talking about two completely different things. So I'd gone from like winning this award and that being like, oh, wow, I've never won anything before, like blah, 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 to suddenly you're going to be doing Live at the Apollo in 30 seconds, being like, holy crap, like <laughs> everything I've ever wanted has just appeared What's on the this catch? ramp. Yeah, yeah. The kind of going like me, really? And then like, he told me that on the Friday and then it wasn't fully confirmed until the Tuesday and that was the longest four days of my life. <laughs> <laughs> my husband was going you'd better get this now because if he's told you that you're getting it before it's confirmed before and I was like yeah yeah yeah. he wouldn't have told me unless it was pretty sure but in my head I'm going it's not gonna be me I'm not gonna get to do it and it was just like this life-changing couple of days so then going back to Edinburgh this year and I just finished up doing my show and I have like fairly temperamental moods and I was in a really low day that day and I finished up my show and went backstage and then suddenly I heard Karen Corrin talking on the microphone who owns the Gilded Balloon where I was performing and she was announcing that I'd won this award for the second year in a row and could I come back up on stage and collect it and I was just in floods of tears <laughs> this whole audience were just like oh she wasn't lying in all her material about being crazy <laughs> she, she's really unstable <laughs> and I was like yes I am <laughs> yeah because I saw that this year that it was at the end of Mm. the show is that how they always do it or no I think they did it this year I think they said because last year they just sort of called me up and then come and found me to do like a a photograph they were like let's make it more of a thing this year which was really nice I think they did the same for Giles Norris who won best show um I think they went and surprised him but they're trying to make it more of a thing because the British comedy guide that run the award they are the nicest people and they're so like into comedy and they're real comedy lovers and they're really supportive of comedy as well as having reviews and listings and stuff they're really invested in it which is is great so. but that's it i think that's how i came about it then is because everyone was like you know going it was such a nice way to do it and yeah so yeah live at the pal how was that oh my god it was amazing amazing like i was so so sort of scared was I scared? I was, I was like a really weird mixture of, um, you know, when you have in your head that if people would just give you the opportunity, you would be brilliant. And then someone gives you the opportunity and you go, oh no, <laughs> <laughs> what if I'm not brilliant? And I was really nervous of just ha- maybe having been deluded. And then I went out and after the first three jokes, which hit thankfully I just thought 
no, this is amazing. Like, I think if you're a club comic, you know, I gig six or seven nights a week. I'm always gigging. That's just what I do easier than anything else. It's the thing I'm best at in the world. Um, so you think, oh, Live at the Apollo, it's this crazy big thing. And then you walk out and you go, oh, it's just people. And I know how to make people laugh. And what easier place to make people laugh in a place where they've really come desperate to laugh. So it was amazing. I loved it. So now, to get to your first gig, but before, I want to just ask, if I said to you, what's your first memory of comedy? What springs to mind? Eddie Izzard and his cassette version of the glorious tour show. Um, my parents had that cassette and my sister and I used to listen to it a lot and I think I still know most of it on repeat because I suppose I watched a lot of comedy cartoons and things as a kid but you didn't think of them as being comedy you thought of them as cartoons sure and that's just what tv was because what kids are watching drama but weird ones so I get I would have watched a lot of comedy stuff but yeah if I think comedy comedy I think Eddie Izzard so obviously, from a young age, you knew what stand-up was, or at least had this cassette as an example of it, yeah. even if maybe you didn't know strictly what it was. Do you remember then when you kind of discovered stand-up and actually went and saw it live? Yeah, I think... I guess I would have watched bits and pieces on the television, things like live at Jonglers or live at the Comedy Store, or like bits and pieces like that. My dad used to watch stand-up, I think, a fair bit. So I remember watching Billy Connolly and things like that. Um, And then live, I think the first live I ever went to was Eddie Izzard. I think my sister got me tickets for my 17th birthday to go to Birmingham and watch him at the ICC. Um, And then club stuff, that would have all started at uni, I think. I don't think I ever went to a comedy club before I was a comedian. I saw a lot of people's tour shows, and but I don't think I went to a comedy club before I was a comic. That's a, that's a very popular answer. Is and, it? and I always say, it's like, oh, sure, look, how would we know about them until yeah. you go seek them out specifically? Because, yeah, I went to a lot of tour shows. But then I'm like, wait, no, the clubs have audiences. Yeah. Well, who are these people? Where yeah. have they come from? <laughs> Why did they find out before I did? Well, I grew up in a small village in Somerset. There wasn't, there wasn't a comedy club in my town, as far as I'm aware. There was a theatre. Um, but I didn't really, I don't know, I guess it just didn't occur to me then. And then I left there at 18 and went to university over in Canterbury. And then in Canterbury, I did. I watched loads of tour shows because there was a theatre on campus over there. Um, So I watched tons of comedy. But again, I don't think there was a comedy club in Canterbury. So I guess I'd have had to have really wanted to seek out a comedy club and like gone around Kent looking for one, which I did not do. But you and also then, don't realise that they're, that they're there. No, no. And then I started sounds mad, doing but stand-up at 20. What happened then for you to want to try and stand up? Or like, was it something that you wanted to do or something that you more fell into? Well, I, I fell into it. This is the most boring origin story, but I was, so I'd gone to, Kent University in Canterbury because they had a three-year program with a fourth-year undergraduate master's and there were loads of options for that fourth year and I wanted to do radio production and then once I got there they scrapped that and then they slowly started scrapping all these different options so by the time I got to my fourth year the only practical options left were directing theatre or stand-up comedy and I'd been doing improvised comedy for about two or three years in the like drama society like a bunch of us would play whose line is it anyway you know for like free at a local at one of the bars on the campus um so that just seemed like a better idea than directing and I loved stand-up comedy I just loved it so most of the 
the degree was pra- was theory, like studying it and studying joke structure and how the room affects what's happening and like the history of stand up comedy through performing arts and vaudeville and variety and how it developed out of music hall comedy and into front cloth comics and then into stand up and went through like folk storytelling, I suppose, through like Jasper Carrot and Billy Connolly and that kind of thing into alternative comedy and and I just thought that was amazing and looking at like the science of why humans laugh in the first place like what is laughter all this stuff was just amazing so I studied it and then as part of that fourth year you had to do 10 gigs and do a portfolio to just feedback it wasn't training you to be a comedian but it was saying go out and do 10 gigs and then analyze why it went well or badly what effect the room had what effect you had the material like you know to just sort of as a sort of working experimental showcase kind of thing and then I did I think something like 50 or 60 gigs instead of 10 because I just loved it I really loved it and then yeah I just sort of left uni and didn't stop doing it really I didn't think originally that I was going to do it as a career but I sort of vaguely wanted to be in showbiz and acting and the theatre and comedy and comedy was just a really good way of doing it without having to audition and stuff you know in comedy like you can just keep doing it like there are people that are terrible at comedy that have been doing it for 25 years and they've never made any money but there is just nothing to stop you turning up to open mics and just doing it and that so appealed to me because with acting and everything else you had to get someone's permission but with comedy you could just do it and that was crazy good yeah see that's also then is another answer of like there's a lot of people who've come from acting yeah sick of waiting for the call or for somebody to write something or cast them they're like look I want to perform and I can go do it this way. Yeah. This sounds like the greatest course ever. Oh my God, I loved it. If you're nerdy about comedy, it was the best thing I've ever done. The theory of it, having to go do gigs. Yeah. Like I studied graphic design. (laughs) It wasn't fun at all. But I bet your website is better than mine now. I I don't have one. Oh, mate, come on. So that's the problem though. It's been in production for seven years. Oh, all right. You're a perfectionist. It's, yeah, and it will never, it'll never do is like pay somebody else. No, it's amazing. So you already had a bit of, I guess, want to perform doing improvised mm-hmm. comedy for a while. Had you done any performing as a child or anything? Yeah, I've act well, I'd acted like not in a like I was a drama school brat at four, but like I did all school plays and um like a few amateur things around my town. You weren't shy at getting up in front of people anyway, so no. No. There's two differences I notice in people that when you start out your first official comedy gig, you're either gonna be worried about the jokes or worried about performing jokes. So you probably didn't have a lot of that that stress when you went and did that first gig. Was this first gig Part of that 10 or did you kind of go rogue or? No, my first stand-up gig was um, the improv group that we did. We ran a night at the other university in the town I was in and we'd go down there once a week and do improv and then we decided because a few of us were interested in stand-up that we would do improv in the second half and stand-up in the first half. So I did five minutes in the first half there or second half whichever way around it went um I wasn't worried about the jokes because I don't think I had any at all but I remember improvising about the room like just doing some stuff on the room and then I must have had some material but I can't remember what it was um like I was nervous because it was different but I've never quite understood why people would be nervous of performing because in my head, performing is much safer than one-on-one stuff. Because if you just go up and talk to somebody one-on-one, they can say anything to you <laughs> and nobody can hear. <laughs> they can be really horrible. You might not know what to say back. They might... That There's so many other things that can happen. Whereas standing up in front of 50 people and saying something, there's a social contract that is probably not going to get broken. So it's much safer. There's far fewer outcomes, I'm, I think. When you see people get nervous then, though, from my own personal experience, I don't get nervous. When I do, I get excited by it because it's yeah. like, right, this must be a special gig or something's on the line here. Yeah. But then I see people get nervous at everything. 
and I'm almost a bit jealous of them. Do you feel that you like it's missing something, or do you think it's definitely a, a benefit? Well, I don't. I don't put any. Um, I have no interest in being nervous. Um, I'm. I'm the same as you. I'm excited. I love it, but I'm not nervous because. I spend most of my life anxious and nervous about f- random crap. Stand up is the one thing where I know I will be one of the top five people in the room at doing it. Like, that's the one time I'm not nervous because it's the only thing I'd consider myself an expert in. That's a great confidence to have, I guess, yeah. Yeah, I love stand up. Stand up is the place I trust myself, stand up is the best version of myself. And also, I just, I don't, I don't know, maybe it's wrong, but I, I don't think the stakes are that high. So like, so what if I have a bad gig? What's going to happen? I'm not going to lose my career over one room of people not getting it or me messing it up somehow. I'm probably just going to leave and they're not going to follow me on Instagram. And then we'll all go about our lives. Like once you break through that, fear of going, what if nobody laughs yeah what if nobody laughs nobody will laugh and then you'll go home and you'll feel a bit sad you'll eat way too much and then you'll try again tomorrow like that that's the oh I've just punched the wall I'm so overexcited <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the extent of the downside of stand-up comedy going wrong is that nobody thinks you're funny oh so what if you really think what you've got is funny you just keep working on it until you find the way that it is always funny that first gig. Yeah. That five minutes. Do you consider that your first stand-up gig? Yeah, I think yeah. so, yeah. So when you realise, you know, as a fan of stand-up, having gone to see stand-up, having watched it on the television, having performed now, but now thinking, right, now I've got to go up. With, with improv, would you generally be with other people on stage? Yeah. So you're going up now as yourself and just you. How do you prepare for that? Or do you, or do you kind of, did you, you were saying that you, you're not sure if you had material? Yeah, I think back then I used to want to be in the right <laughs> energy space for it. Um, I used to want to be in the right mood, I think. I think I used to try and be fluttery and excited and energetic and kind of bring almost like a character to it. Um now I think it's much more about knowing what opening line I'm going to have to just get them on board with the opening line and then move on. Um, but back then it felt more like a ritual of like needing the energy to be right and like flow with you a bit, I think. And um, do you remember anything about that, that first show? So you said you performed improv in the first half. Yeah, or maybe it was the second half. I can't remember which way round that went. But I remember feeling like I was pretty safe in that room. I remember thinking, um, oh, something will happen. Um, and I knew quite a lot of the room. And like, we're only talking about 15 people being in there anyway. It's not like I was playing a 300 seater club, you know. And like, five of those people were the rest of the improv group. And then like, six people that were like diehard comedy university nerds. And then, you know, if you're going to a comedy club to watch a university improv troupe, you're not expecting that higher level of comedy. No offense, all university improv troupes, but we were terrible. Did you know that at the time? But they weren't expecting No, us. because everybody was having a great time yeah. because that's all you've really watched, isn't it? You've not got the money at uni to go to you know, big clubs and watch people actually killing it. So it's funny at the time and, you know, comedy's all variable isn't it but I think I felt I think I felt like the room would be sympathetic so I could at least try this stuff out and I've like you can't really practice stand-up can you so there was that feeling to me like well if this isn't very good how could I possibly have known until I tried it do you remember any of the jokes you told that night I remember there being something about how many fans there were on the ceiling. Um, There were loads of grills. I was doing that. And I think I might have had material about... I definitely had some stuff about being from Somerset. Um, And I think I might have had some jokes about how to do a poo very quietly in a stall by making a raft out of toilet paper to catch it. 
but maybe that was a bit later. I definitely remember that being some of my earliest material. So you said you talked about the fans in the room. Yeah. So like, even initially, you weren't like going, right, here's what I no. got to say. You, you were able to, you know, kind of maybe freestyle or kind of riff a bit. Yeah, I think because in my head, that's what stand-up comedy is. Stand-up should be different every time a little bit. I, and I'm not, I don't mean that like it should and those are my laws, but just that's what I like it to be coming from me. I like stand-up that sounds off the cuff. I like very chatty comics that have got jokes hidden in the chat. I'm not that keen on very performative. Knowing that you're like you're present in the moment as well. Yeah. Like. And I think it just didn't, I was very naive when I first started doing stand up. I thought, you know, you could just go out and rip it by improvising stuff. And I didn't learn for a couple of years that no, actually you can improvise maybe one line, but then they've got to be six absolute belters to back it up. Like, but, but sure, but probably natural coming from the improvised yeah. comedy that you would try that. But then do you think that we spoke about this earlier that might be, we might have a clip of elsewhere is about relating to, to comparing. Do you think that helps find your way into, in, into that kind of field, being good on your feet from that improv yeah, background? I think so yeah, definitely. The improv definitely helped with that because when I started doing stand up, I had, complete confidence and stage presence I had no material to back it up but I was absolutely looked like oh she looks like she knows what she's doing and then you know I then learned to write to go with it but the writing came much much slower than the performing for me do you remember what you did after the show or even after you came off stage no probably drank snake bite cider and lager with black currant <laughs> Say that slowly now for me. We half a pint of lager, half a pint of cider, in together with blackcurrant cordial. That was the drink of choice. Snake bite, it's Snake called. Snake bite, that's what we used to call it at uni, yeah. Like even here in Dublin, we've got our own stereotypes about drinking. That's something I've never heard of <laughs> that's before. That's disgusting. That terrifies me. <laughs> I don't think I've drunk it for like since. I, I'm not even curious years. to try it. No, 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 no <laughs> don't be. <laughs> I guess you were going to this first one. You knew you had to do more. Was yeah. that part of this 10 initially? No, that, that one wasn't. That one I think I did around, so what year? I would have started my final year at uni, September 2008. So I think I probably did that that spot probably early 2008 in preparation for 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 starting the course the next year. Um, and then, like when, you know, when you first start, there's big gaps between your gigs. Sure, like yeah. now, you think, you know, I'm doing as many gigs in a week as I used to do in a month. It's like I've had four days off, or no? <laughs> um, so there's probably a couple of months. And then I would gig quite, well, I'd be doing improv comedy every week. And rehearsing that once or twice a week. So I was getting a lot of practice at like that side of it, but not performing solo stand up. And then it was probably quite a big gap. Or maybe I did a couple more at that at that club. And then it would have been like late 2008 into the beginning of 2009 was when I started doing the, the ones I needed for the course. Um, so mainly in London, I really remember my first ever London gig was at the King's Head, the Lion's Den, it was called, and it was a gong show. And I'd gone with two friends, um, to do this gong show. And there was this, if you passed it, they played that. But if you got gonged off, this awful noise played. And I just remember my best friend turning around to me going, if that noise plays, this is the plan for how we make you feel better. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and then I think it went all right. I beat the gong. Um, I didn't win. Gemma Whelan won, as in Game of Thrones, Gemma Whelan and Upstart Crow and like her career. I mean, what happened to her? She was doing a character called Chast Chastity Butterworth. And it was really funny. And she won that show. Um, yeah, and then I sort of did that. And then we went back to Canterbury, I think. And 
I think that was the, the my early days in comedy were like being just good enough that you'd be like, yeah, all right, you've got potential, but not, I wasn't one of those people that was like effortlessly excellent right from the start. You know when you meet those people and they're like on all the TV and you go, how long have you been going? Oh, it's a year and a half yesterday. And you go, you joking? Like, what are you talking about? Who's this good in a year and a half? I was not one of those people, but I also wasn't dreadful. But no, it sounds like you were putting in the working because it was, it was funny that you said there that you did these gigs in preparation for the following year. So in that year where you're going to go study, learn and get ready to do a gig, <laughs> you wanted to prepare for that yeah. by doing gigs. Oh, I'm a total nerd. Yeah. Well, that's good. What's the, what's the school term? Cramming or something like yeah. that before you even start? Yeah, that's me. If before that first time get up and doing five minutes, if you could pull yourself aside other than take the pint of snake bit out of your hand. <laughs> what, what do you think you'd today go back and say to yourself before you go on stage? Please write some jokes. <laughs> I'd like to say that to the first five years of my career, I think. Please have more discipline with yourself. You're, you'd love it to be true that you're this ethereal boho creature that jokes come to. You can't sit down and write. You, you can and you need to and you should. And you should be very disciplined about trying to write because everything gets better once you stop funnying about and sit down and write. You're doing this preparation for next year, but it's not enough. (laughs) Try harder. But maybe, maybe that would be terrible advice because maybe then I wouldn't have been as like freeform and happy and enjoying myself on stage. So maybe it wouldn't have been a bad idea. But I know my career definitely got better when I stopped believing this fantasy that sitting down and writing wasn't how I worked and it was like no you don't like it you find it really difficult and it worries you but you can do it so sit down and do it thanks for talking about your first day today thanks for having me and there you have it Laura Lex and my first gig guys hope you enjoyed it really really enjoyed that chat I hope you did too if you enjoyed this you know what you need to do tell your friends Text your friends, email your friends, shout at your friends, but you could be doing that every single day. What's important is validation where other people can see it. Yes, I'm talking about online social media. Please head on over to at my first gig on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, and let people know you're listening to the episode. Let me know that you're enjoying the episode and get a sneak peek at next week's guest a little bit early as well. If you enjoyed that chat and you want to see more from Laura, her new tour, Knee Jerk, it's all of the best bits from her past Edinburgh shows, hits the road next week. So that's starting February 2020, February 5th in Maidenhead, going up and down the UK between now and June. Head over to lauralex.co.uk for tickets. Twitter at Laura Lex, Instagram at Lex Laura, Facebook at Laura Lex Comedian. And if you haven't already, head on over to comedycentral.co.uk or on Sky On Demand. You can get Laura's episode of Roast Battle going up against her husband, Tom Livingstone. Great episode. Do check it out. It's great. And you'll also be treated to a battle from RuPaul Drag Race UK contestants and some of the members of drag group Denim. But yes. Check me out too, you know? It's not all about everybody else. It's about me, Dwayne Dugan, the world-famous podcaster. You can find me online at Dwayne Dugan, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all of that. If you're in Ireland, if you're in Dublin, come by to Cherry Comedy every single Monday night. I've, I've forgot if this is the intro or the outro now. That's 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 how sleepy I'm getting. Right, this episode's got to go. So I'm going to go chuck it all together, put it out, and get it into your ears, and then I'm going to go to sleep. So when, when I'm asleep, if you listen to this episode morning of release send a message at to, at my first gig or at Dwayne Dugan and let me know that you're listening so I can wake up and go oh wow it's dark again it's it's 5 p.m but look everyone's enjoying this that's it for this week on my first gig podcast guys hope you've enjoyed it see you again I don't know how to end this I have a note here that says don't eat your shower Joe it's pretty good advice smells great never tastes the same see you next week It's the My First Gig Podcast. Whoa.